morning, good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you. We're going to people of a true purple today. Hope you're feeling grand and all's when you will. Hello there, everybody. Uh, why did I salute? Anyway, uh, excuse me, and I burped as well, so. A salute and a burp is how we're going to start this video. Anyway, moving on. So, uh, welcome to the A&Q Wednesday, everybody. Let's get to question one. So, question one today is, uh, how did you achieve to be as comfortable as you are with the main riff to the Red Hot Chili Peppers song, Snow? Uh, just, I don't know, um, it's just practice, um, I, I can't play it, obviously for obvious copyright reasons, because Warner Brothers would have a fit, damn it, you play that riff, David Simpson, and we'll come over there, and we'll cut off your fingernails so short, that your finger will bend the wrong way when you play the guitar, that's my impression of Warner Brothers. Brought to you by the Dave Simpson Acting Group 2021. Anyway, but no, uh, how did I... <laughs> that noise was free next time I'm charging. Anyway, um, I've lost my mind. So, uh, so yeah, so where are we? So yeah, the snow riff. I'd love to be able to play it and, and talk a bit more about it, but I can't. So how did I come so comfortable with playing it? It was just through practice. I mean, I literally learned that the day that album came out. I remember going to get Stadium Arcadium from Woolworths. Um, and as soon as I heard Snow, I was just obsessed with that riff. And I remember figuring it out. And um, it, can't, it can't have been more than two days after I got the album. And just like... But the thing was, it's... It, <laughs> I don't want to say I had a kind of an, a, a, an extra bonus on it, but because I've been playing in John's style for, where are we, two, three, four, five, six, for about four years by that time, I kind of understood where he was going with it, but, and through learning stuff, kind of like crazy kind of stretch chords and stuff, and also playing my thumb over the top, I kind of had a that advantage, because a lot of people who try and play the snow riff have never really played their thumb over the top. You know, I know, I know a lot of people who've, who've asked me about playing that riff before and they play with a thumb behind the neck and it's it's really difficult. Snow is really one of those riffs where you have to play with your thumb over top. It's a Jimi Hendrix inspired kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, John himself says like, you know, he, uh, I can kind of do something. Um, let me tell you it's standard. One sec. Okay, so. I can I can play kind of in the style of, but I can't play the riff. But but uh, I mean the chords are G sharp minor, E major, B major, and uh, F sharp major. And John was saying like um, instead of kind of playing it the normal kind of like Jimi Hendrix way, which would be kind of Which kind of like that kind of thing. He 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 inside he decided that picking it would be a better idea, and adding the diddly in there would be a, would be a cooler idea. So watch that still get flagged for copyright. Anyway, but I, I, I've. I've come, gone totally off script here. But yeah, um, but I think because I, I was playing in that kind of like Hendrix. That Hendrix kind of style, John Fashanti style anyway. I think I had a kind of like that kind of little leg up, so to say, when I learned the riff because I had my foot, I was used to my thumb being over the top. A lot of people that I've taught this riff to or people who have shown me this riff who, who struggle with it, invariably don't really use their thumb over top but you know it's a lot of that kind of like you know if you want to call it traditional i don't i, I don't think it like it kind of is traditional but playing with a thumb behind the neck thing so when it comes to kind of playing that riff with your thumb behind the neck it's, it, it puts your fingers in a bad position snow is really one of those riffs i feel you have to play with your thumb right over the top of the neck it's not really a, a, a riff i think that's comfortable to play like this you know you don't you don't want to be going like this because that's just I mean, that's just putting so much pressure on your form. Really bad for you. Really, really bad for you. Not a good idea. So, I mean, it, it didn't it didn't take me too long to be able to get the, the, the flow of it. I mean, I'd love to be able to play it. I can't, though. But... I 
you know, um, that's about as close, uh, pro- close as I can get, and that's probably might be too close. I don't know. We'll find out. But um, but it didn't take me too long. I'd say. I mean, I kind of like because I've been learning that style anyway. That Jimi Hendrix kind of like you know Boulder's Love style, where you are kind of. You know that 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 really ornate Curtis Mayfield, Jimi Hendrix, John Frusciante thing, it's, which is just gorgeous, and I'd love to play in that style. Um, I think I kind of have a bit of a leg up because I'd been doing that for about six years by that time. Uh, six years, three, four, five, six, four years. Doy, he's clever. He can count. Okay, so um, so I think I had a bit of a leg up, but it didn't take me too long. I probably had it in about a couple of months. I don't remember, but it was just practice more than anything, and and it just comes down to kind of like you know just. Uh, again, form over the top and just really dedicating yourself to just kind of like getting it, getting it right and also relaxing. I see a lot of people who play snow who are really stiff. Like, there's a lot of people who I've seen play it and they're just kind of really tense and it's really, really jerky and it, it, there's no flow to it whatsoever. And also the guitar tone, obviously, you know, neck pick up with that dirty, cleanish kind of tone. It needs to flow. You know, it's, you know, the only part that's really emphasized by well is, is the diddly dum. You know, um, these bits, they're not emphasised. They're actually quite... John's actually picking them quite lightly. The, uh, that's the... That's the emphasis. Whereas a lot of people I see play it, it's like every note is the same velocity. It's like... Aah! And it's just like... It's not that way. You need the emphasis. That... And I think... That's another thing, actually thinking about it now, I think that's another thing that makes it hard to play for people is the fact they're trying to very full intensity all the time. Because when you're picking lightly on those, it gives you that bit of a break, you know, because you're only, you're only really hammering on really hard on that kind of, that diddly done there. So you've always got to think about dynamics. It's the same as like, if you listen to like stuff like uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit, you know, in, in that on the, on the main riff, that dun 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 you know, it's a it's it's where the emphasis is that makes the thing that makes it powerful, and the same goes for snow or any riff like that that's got those kind of that as emphasis, and that's what pushes it along. And like I say, it also gives you that ability to rest in the in the gaps, so to say. You know, because you're not at full. Uh, Velocity, that's not really the right word, but you're not like a full dynamic all the time. The only time you kind of really uh, going really crazy is when you're doing that. So, you know, you vote those are quite kind of light, and then that's a lot heavier because that's where the emphasis of that riff is. And like I say, in this bit, you can kind of relax because this hand takes a bit of a break, you know, but then it hits in really hard. So dynamic is really important in that. Getting the form over is really important in that. Getting the right sound is important in that as well. It's not super clean. It sounds super clean, but it really isn't. Honestly, trust me, I, I promise you it's not. Just because it sounds it doesn't mean it is it. It's 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 an illusion. It really is. Um, there's, that, it's, there's more to it than meets the eye. And again, it's what gives it um, give when you play it. You know, if you're if you're trying to play this riff on a super, super clean amplifier it's going to be really hard work because the amplifier is just going to just punish you. You know, it's just going to punish you and it's not an easy riff to play because of the stretches and the movements and this hand locking with this hand. So you do need that kind of like little bit of overdrive there and a little bit of amp give, you know, so it's not as hard. But you also, you don't want to have it too distorted where you where you lose emphasis on the diddly dum bits. So, um... So it's all about getting the right kind of sound and the right kind of like dynamic and the right kind of emphasis and push. And also getting your fingers to kind of like, you know, behave themselves on the riff and also getting comfortable with the kind of the stretch things. I mean, John plays it in a different way to me. I, I use my first finger, ring finger and little finger to play the uh, the first two chords. Uh, John actually uses his first, second and third fingers to play the, the, the riff. So... He starts like that, and then he, he does that, and then I think I've seen him do it that that the, the the B major. I've seen him do it like that, but I've also seen him do it like that. When he goes up here to the uh, the F sharp major, he's definitely like this. But John actually plays it with those fingers more than more than anything, you know, um, like that. Uh, 
but because that's the way John does it, I found it a lot easier to use those three fingers and basically kind of like not really use my uh, middle finger at all because it just it didn't want to behave. I have tried to do it in the John way, but it feels really uncomfortable to me. So bear that in mind as well. You know, don't try and copy what fingers John uses to do it because it might not work for you. Like I say, it just depends. You know, you've got to really kind of go by what what's right for you really uh, to get the job done. But yeah, I do really do feel it's, it's a thumb over riff. This is it's, it's not one of those riffs you can play with a thumb behind the neck or anything like that. It's it's one of those riffs that you have to play with your thumb over the top because as soon as your thumb goes behind the neck, all the tendons in your wrist here are going to start getting like compressed, and you're not going to have as much freedom as movement, a uh, freedom of movement. Whereas if your hands are like this with the thumb over, they're just going directly into the neck, which means you've got a lot more uh, freedom and stretch as well if I mean if I play that chord if I play that chord there the uh, the E major uh, triad just the uh, you know the first third and fifth like this with my thumb over top that's really comfy I could hold that all day I'm not going to cause any issues for myself or you know because it, it's just comfortable you know uh, because of the way my tendons go into the into the guitar neck and my fingers you know nothing's strained there but the moment I start moving my thumb around to the back of the neck, I can feel the tension starting on my fingers. And so if I put my thumb in like a place where it's traditional, you, you can hear, it actually, I can't do it, it hurts. It's, it's hurting that top of my hand and into my wrist here. And it, it hurts. It's really, actually, I've made my fingers kind of go a bit funny. I've got really cold hands today. Uh, but um, that made my fingers tingle for a split second there because I was in a wrong position. It's not very nice. So I would say, like, you know, if you are learning snow, bear that in mind of, like, having your thumb over the top. It's good. If you've never done it before, it's going to take a long time for you to get used to doing it. But honestly, it's a better way than trying to do it without your thumb. And also think about flow. Don't attack the guitar. You know, I mean, it's got to flow. John's really relaxed when he plays it. You can see how relaxed he is. I and mean, he has to be relaxed because he has to sing at the same time as playing it. And eventually, you know, you do, you do get to a point where you can just kind of, like, yeah, you talk and play it. It becomes really second nature. So just bear that in mind, people with you, if you are learning the riff snow, thumb over top is really important. It's a Jimi Hendrix kind of style thing. You don't really want to be playing with a thumb behind the neck. It's not that kind of thing. Um, and it'll also help you in the long run with the stretches and stuff like that. God, that really hurt. Whoa. It'll go away in a minute. But uh, but yeah, that wasn't very... You know, I just wanted to show you. But um, can you just tenses your hand up? And again, just remember that these, those aren't heavily picked. The only thing that's heavily picked is, is the diddly dumb bit. Um, yeah, that's the only thing that's really heavy picked. The rest, that's not heavy picked. That's just kind of relaxed and loose. And then that's the emphasis of the riff. I'm trying to do it atonally so I don't get copyright flag for just humming the riff, which can happen as well. Anyway, um... But yeah, I mean, I, I got comfortable with it fairly quick, but like I say, I'm, I was used to playing that kind of style anyway, so it took me about a month or so to get it right. And again, it, it's just never, it's never really, there are some days, depending on temperature, uh, or uh, if I've warmed up properly, if my hand's properly warmed up, where it might be a bit of a struggle to kind of keep it going. But invariably, by the second verse, that's kind of gone away. Uh, it's just a case of, you know, again, it's just a case of practice and repetition and doing it over and over and over again and finding a comfortable way to do it and lock in instead of kind of like putting yourself through uh, any kind of any kind of pain or trouble. You know, you don't want to be doing that kind of thing, you know, where it's kind of like, you know, if you're doing this while you're playing it, there's something wrong. You don't want to be doing that, you know. It wants to kind of like be a mild uncomfortableness at most, you know what I mean, uh, where you might have to just dig a little bit deeper to get it through but invariably you don't want to be doing that you don't want, you don't want to be if it hurts you need to find another way um okay so uh but yeah it didn't take me too long it took me a little bit but not a great deal of time but again i think it's because i always played with a thumb over the top by that point anyway i kind of had that kind of more comfortable feel you know what i mean it, it, it wasn't as a it wasn't as big a hardship to kind of like get to these stretches having learned a lot of john stuff like you know i could die for you where you got chords like this and big stretches like that and doing chords like that in the first place and also learning stuff like Message in a Bottle by the Police where you got the Ad 9 chord, the Andy Summers chord. Learning stuff like that, doing kind of the stretches in snow, it, it didn't really 
um, it wasn't the biggest hardship in the world. I feel that's really egotistical to say, and I do apologise to people too. I don't want it to come across that way. But it, it didn't take me a great deal of time to learn snow. And I, I'm being honest. I'm not. I'm not trying to be a hey, look at me. I was able to do that in like a couple of months, man. You know, I'm not trying to be that. I hate that. That's not me. And I, ugh, I feel weird now. Um, don't like that. Okay, so I'm not trying to do an ego trip. We're not doing that. Go away. Move on. Okay, so yeah, but yeah, bear that in mind, people too. Uh, thumb over the top, and you know, just be aware of emphasis. There's so many people out there who play this riff with the same velocity on every note. It's wrong. It's like people who play Missaloo uh, by Dick Dale, and it's all it's all sixteenth notes. It's not sixteenths, you know. Uh, Missaloo's that. And uh, I know that because Dick Dale said so. And he should know because he wrote it. And I, I love how Dick Dale explains this. Emphasis is really important and rhythm is really important. Because Dick Dale says, you can't dance to this. There's nothing. It's no emphasis. It's just one continuous thing. But you can dance to this. You know, Mickey's got... It's like a drummer, you know, which what Dick Dale was in the first place. And that's why he carried it over to the guitar for Missaloo is because, like, you know, you can, you've can got you got a rhythm. You know, this isn't Missaloo. This is Missaloo. Because you can feel it, the emphasis, in the, the emphasis on... Same thing with snow. You know, think of it from a drummer's perspective. You know, you've got that, and that's that's what makes it move. Uh, smells like Teen Spirit. You know, uh, Black by Pearl Jam at the end. It's got the same thing of like. You know, it, all emphasis is so important. It's so cool. It's something my dad taught me about when I when I was first starting to play guitar. I was learning an Irish reel on guitar and I could play it, but my dad was like, y you're not playing it right. And I was like, oh, yeah, but I am. And he goes, no, because you're not doing emphasis. There's no emphasis on the notes that need to be emphasised. I was just going through the reel and everything was the same. And dad goes, no, it needs to go da -da there. It needs to jump up there because that's the emphasis on that note. And... Um, and, and as I learned that from my dad, so it's, it, it, and it is, I've always carried that as really important when you're doing a riff like that or something like that. It has to have that emphasis and it has to be something that grabs people, you know, rhythm and something like that. It really, and I always feel like thinking from a drumming perspective on that is always better. You know, how, how would a drummer emphasize that? Where would the snare go? Or the cymbal hit or the bass drum? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's really important. And Snow's no different to that. You know, like, like, uh, you know, he's got kind of like a, kind of like a light hit, light hit, heavy, light, light, heavy. Well, yeah, deca, 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 deca. yeah. Anyway, I've done that enough. But yeah, it didn't take me too long to get it. But like I say, I think I had a leg up because I'd already kind of like learned that Jimi Hendrix style. And I, I really think that Snow, the chords to Snow sound ace in that Jimi Hendrix kind of style. Like... Yeah, it's there's something really cool in just playing it like that. But yeah, but I understand why John did it the way he did. It was just something totally different. You know, it's still got the Hendrix kind of influence in there, but it's something totally different. It's really cool. It's one of the coolest riffs John's ever done, in my opinion. I really love it. Okay, so um, so yeah, I hope that's answered your question in somewhat shape and form. Like I say, just forget the stupid bit where you know, let's just forget that bit. Okay, so let's move on. Because I've talked about that for a long time and I didn't mean for it to go on for about 20 minutes. So I do apologise for you. Move on to question two. Okay, so uh, have you ever listened to Elliot Smith? Uh, yeah, occasionally. My, my sister's a huge Elliot Smith fan. Uh, she's a massive Elliot Smith fan. But um, I've listened to him every now and again. But uh, I don't get as much... I do apologise about my phone. Uh, I don't get as much from him as my sister does. I mean, I do love some of his songs, but like, I'm not the biggest fan of him. But he is great. And he's you know, such a tragic figure really Elliot is you know in a way you know not in a way he is a tragic figure it's it's so sad really how 
how he's not here, you know, because he was he was a very talented man, but he had demons, and the demons got him eventually. So I can't really speak to about Elliot Smith too much. You need my sister for that one. Um, but I have listened to him every now and again, but he's not someone I listen to a lot or very much at all, to be honest with you. But I do respect him, and I do love some of his music, and I, I love his voice. It's really, really cool, really cool. Um, I think I prefer the Heat Miser stuff, uh, Miser stuff than uh, actually Elliot Smith, but that's me. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I like the more heavier thing. But anyway, uh, but I'm going to move on from that because I can't really talk too much about Elliot Smith. I'm not really in now. Like I say, you need my sister to talk about Elliot Smith, um, which I'm sure she would love to do because she's a big Elliot Smith fan. Anyway, I'm uh, going to move on to question three now. Okay, so question three. Now, this is a tough one. Now, this is a very tough question to answer. So, question three is, if you could only take one strap home from France, would it be Nicole's white strap or Marjo's red strap? Now, this question is really tough to answer because I love both Nicole's and Marjo's straps. They are amazing guitars. Um, and... Yeah, they're, they're both awesome. That's the problem. So trying to pick one of those is nigh on impossible. But if I can explain something, I must say that I had a stronger emotional attachment to Nicole's strap than I did Marjo's. Marjo's strap was gorgeous and it plays so well. But Nicole's strap was one of those guitars that, burrowed if you will into me you know more so than the red devil there was just something about i mean when when i when i played it in the videos i played it on it allowed me to express myself on that level that i, that I always want to be able to uh, express myself on and, and certain guitars won't allow you to do that because um for what for whatever reason i don't actually know why certain guitars just won't do that certain guitars will you know uh the, the black strat here uh my white one the red oz wall they you know they allow me you know and this one as well they allow me to express myself at a really heavy level whereas certain other guitars i have will allow me to express myself to a certain level but not go that extra mile if you will you know and the cold strat it really had a um a pull on me. Um, now I don't know why that is, but I could, every time I played that guitar, there was there was something in it. Apart from it, it was just like gorgeous and it played so well. There was just an extra kind of like emotional thing to it, and it was just it was just very pleasant. And, it, and like I say, it, it just it went here, which is where it, it wanted to go. And I was able to kind of really express in the in the videos where I was playing it, um, I was really able to express through it. And Marjo's strap was the same, but it it didn't quite get to the level of heaviness that Nicole's did, if that makes any sense. Like Marjo's strap was very kind of like emotionally charged as well, um, but. It didn't quite get to the level of Nicole's, which is a bit weird. You know what I mean? But again, you know, why does this happen? You know, this is that weird snake oily thing that people talk about. It's like, you know, why does that guitar or amp do this thing for said person, whereas another one doesn't? You know, what, what is it? You know, because I know, you know, people, you know, I, could, I picked up this guitar. When I, as soon as I picked up this guitar, it was like one of those really heavy moments where I was like, and it's not because of what it is. It's because of, how it spoke to me uh, internally and how I was able to kind of like express through this thing. I couldn't express through, I can't express through any other guitar I've got the way I can express through this one because the way I express through this one is totally unique to, uh, not in an egotistical way, but it's it's different, if you will, to the way I express myself through Mr. White or my Red Oswald, you know what I mean? There's, there's certain things, there's certain things in different guitar, excuse me, that leads you down different emotional routes, if you will. And um, this one's got it. And well, all my all the guitars I've got here have got it because that's why I've got these ones. You know, uh, in all fairness, there's not a guitar in this room. Actually, there is one. 
Well, actually, there's two. Um, there is two guitars in this room. I don't really have... Uh, when I play them, that emotion isn't... I find it hard to connect with them. And uh, one of them is my Epiphone Les Paul. I really struggle to connect to that guitar. It has to be at the right time. I can pick up any of the other guitars in this room and just immediately be connected with it. But the Epiphone fights me. And the same with, with the Hofner Verifin that's over there on the wall. I can't connect straight away. Whereas with all these other guitars, as soon as I pick them up, it's like I'm in, you know, they're, they're me and I'm them. There's no conflict of conflict of interest, so it's just straight away. And I like that. I really, I, and that's the way I kind of like can find guitars that work for me. I've played a lot of guitars that don't have that and I'm not interested in them. I don't care what they are. You know, um, John Entwistle's 1962 Fender Strap was one of those. You know, I've, I thought I would be an absolutely enamored with that guitar and I just wasn't. You know, it just wasn't there. But that that's like, it's a Fiesta Red original 1962 as Paul. Um, you know, but it, it didn't work. You know, I, I, wouldn't have pe I wouldn't have bought that guitar. You know, it, I wasn't even sad to see it go, to be honest with you. I was sad how it got sold, but uh, but yeah, either way. But um, that's another story. Um, but certain guitars have that and certain guitars don't. And like I say, Marjo's and Nicole's Strats, they both had really... Um, strong emotional attachment, you know, to me. Like when, as soon as when I played them, I could I could feel them. You know what I mean? I could feel the guitar. I, but and the, but the only thing is like Nicole's let me go that extra mile, whereas Marjo's kind of stopped a mile back. But when it comes down to kind of which one would I have, it, it's it, it's hard to pick. You know, because you know I love them both so much. They're, they're both amazing guitars. You know. Um, I, I definitely played Marjo's more. Uh, I definitely played Marjo more than Nicole, but that was mainly because Nicole was playing hers. <laughs> she, <laughs> she never put it down. But that's the way it should be. But, um... Because uh, Marjo played a Telecaster more. Because um, she's more of a, a telly person. But uh, I, I definitely played the Red Devil more. But when I played the, Nicole's White Strat, there was definitely, like I say, there was that extra mile of... of, of really digging out everything you know and sometimes it was very uncomfortable but i kind of you know in a weird sadistic kind of way and you know, if you can call it sadistic i kind of like that in a guitar you know i like it when it makes me really dig deep and and and, and dig out all this darkness or horribleness or it makes me remember something i wish i hadn't done or makes me wish i had said something when i didn't say it and stuff like that i like when guitars bring up those emotions in me I don't like it when a guitar, I pick it up and it's just a guitar. If that makes sense. I borrow sounds really silly. But you know what I mean? I, I don't like it when that's the case. I like it. I like them to really connect with me. And if they don't connect with me, I'm not interested. And it's got to a point now, like I say, I mean, I've, I've said this in previous videos and other videos, that I can pick up a guitar and within the first couple of seconds, I'll know if that's there or it's not there. Um... And I said a good example of that was uh, when Revelation sent me the RTL 55 and the RTL 59. Um, I thought I was immediately going to... I didn't even want to demo the 59, to be honest with you. Uh, when Revelation... Because I actually asked... I requested Revelation to send me the 55, the black Les Paul custom with the P90s gold hardware. That's the one I wanted. And I was, I was determined I was going to buy it as well. As soon as I was done demoing it, I'm going to buy that Les Paul... Because I want it, you know what I mean? And so they sent that and they said, oh, we're going to send you the RTL 59 as well. And I was like, I'm not really interested. I don't care. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, so they sent they sent me the 59. And so when, when they came, I remember unboxing them and I immediately unboxed the 55. And I was like, oh my God, it's so cool. And I was playing it. I didn't even box the 59. <laughs> I was just like, you can stay in your box. I don't care. It was quite, it's quite funny to think now. And it just sat in that room, just in its box, while I was playing the playing the 55 through my katana here. I was like, yeah, this is so cool. And I thought, okay, let's give the 59 a try. And I connected with the 55. It was good. I liked it, you know. But then I took, and I unboxed the 59, and I put my hand on the neck, and I was like, oh. And I plugged it in, and I was like, I love you. Can we get married? And... It's still here. You know what I mean? And the 55 went back. And funny enough, 
I literally, it, the weird, because it, it was totally against what I expected. But again, the only thing I didn't like about it was the, sun, the cherry sunburst. Again, that's gone now. But um, I was just immediately taken by it. More so than any Les Paul I've probably ever played. Yeah, I would say probably that, uh, more so than any other Les Paul I've played. I've probably, I was probably taken by this one the most, which is why it's my number one Les Paul. If I need a Les Paul, that's where I go. You know, it replaced the V100, the vintage, the Peter Green one. You know, and I just, I always get drawn back to it just because I've got such a strong connection to it. And it was funny, actually. Like, the only, after that initial first day, the only time I played the 55 again is when I did the review on it. The 55, I never touched it again. I just played the 59, and I immediately was like, Revelation said, I, I, I need this guitar. You know, and so I bought it. And, um, cause, and uh, funny enough, they said, oh, we can send you one uh, with a different finish. If you don't like the Cherry Burst, we can actually send you a different colour. And I was like, no, 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 no. Because when I stripped the top off, they said, well, we could have sent you another colour. And I was like, no, because that one might not have connected to me as much as this one did. You know what I mean? If, if, if I had sent that one back and then got another one and it didn't connect as much, I've now lost that guitar. And that's a no-no. So that's why I kept this one and just stripped the top off. And, you know, um, and I, I, I just I love the look of that guitar. I love the way it feels. I love the way it sounds. It's not heavy, which is just heaven for me. Because the body's... Uh, it's got a mahogany neck, but the body's uh, not... It's a solid body, but it's not a mahogany body. And yeah, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Uh, the pickups in this thing as well are just gorgeous. I just love this guitar. It's my favourite Les Paul I've probably ever played. Um, you know, it, it just has some... Again, it's got what certain guitar... It's got that extra mile, if you will. So, I'm tangenting again, but hey, that's what I'm here to do. That's what I do, and I can't not do it, I'm afraid. So I do apologise. But, um, but yeah, so... But that's what I look for in a guitar. I, li I like them to be me, not a guitar. You know, I like to be able to connect with them on a like really heavy emotional level and not just kind of like, just be like, it's a guitar. You know, the Epiphone Les Paul here on the wall is a guitar, sadly. As much as I love it and I'm emotionally attached to it because my mum and dad bought me it and it's my second ever guitar, I'm not emotionally invested in it in a way of play when I play it. I'm emotionally invested in it because of what it means to me. Uh, but when I play it, I'm disconnected. It takes a lot for me to connect with it. Whereas if I pick up the RTL 59 or the Tokai here or the Gretsch or the 335s there or my you know, the Black Strat or any of these beasts on the wall here, I'm immediately connected. You know what I mean? There's an immediate connection there. There's no there's no middleman. You know, there's no there's nothing getting in the way. It's just me and the guitar, you know, to not to be in a hippie kind of weird way, Zen way, but just as one. You know, it's not just me and the guitar, it's us. You know, and I don't like the mules. Uh, the, the, I don't like the me and me and the guitar kind of thing. And I, I don't like the idea of kind of like, oh, it's a tool. You know what I mean? It's like you know, yeah, fair enough to some people, but to me, it's not a tool. It's a, it's a it's a way of expressing myself. You know what I mean? It's an extension of me. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, for whatever that means. But um, like I said, it, so if I had to pick between Nicole and Marjo Strats based on solely how I feel about them. I would have to pick Nicole's because it just takes it just takes me that extra bit to get out what's in. Although I absolutely adore the way Marjo's feels. I actually prefer the way Marjo Strap feels to Nicole's, but Nicole's has a more emotional response and that's more you know, that that's that's the that's the big selling point. But I like that the high gloss finish on Marjo's neck like because like it's, it's a 50s reissue it's got that high gloss neck finish which I absolutely adore um, the look of and feel of as well it's just it's just amazing and and it, it, you know I, I really love that I love the way that feels and I love the way um, you know that certain thing is but Nicole's strap because it's got that kind of USA kind of almost waxy kind of finish I'm not as a big fan of that as I am with with the high gloss um, lacquer, which is a bit weird because I actually like no lacquer on the back of the neck, but sometimes I don't mind it. Anyway, another another story for another time. But solely based on what I feel like, if I had to pick between the two, if somebody was saying, "Right, well, you've got to gig one of them," I would pick Nicole's just because it helps me get out what's in. But if it went to feel 
based uh, uh, how it how it how uh, you know f- how it feels to play i prefer the way marjos feels so it's kind of like a toss-up really um but if there was one it'd have to be nicole's just because like i say it, d- it takes me to that extra mile of emotion where I, I can get out what's in and that's really important for me to be, ex- be able to express if i can't express through a guitar i don't want it and i don't i don't want anything to do with it same goes with amplifiers and pedals if i can't express i'm not interested you know, it's all about that. It's not about necessarily down to eventually what it looks like or what's on the headstock or this that, and the other. It's about can I use it as a as 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 a way for me to express what's in. You know what I mean? Can it be an extension of me? You know, and if not, then I'm no, I'm not interested. And like I say, Nicole's strap. There was just something about that guitar when I was playing it. Especially, I can't remember which video it was. I don't know if it was the video of it or the video of the Blues Junior. I, I, I feel it was the demo of Nicole's White Strat where I, it just went, it was very heavy, but it could be the Blues Junior I forget, I don't remember because I'd have to watch them back and I don't do that. Um, but yeah, so just purely on kind of like, you know, that basis, it'd have to be Nicole Strat, but Marjo's is just gorgeous as well. You know, there's, 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 there's pusses and, bo- pusses and, you know, for, for both, but Nicole's just has that extra bit. You know, and I hope I've explained that in a way that makes some kind of sense. But yeah, so that, there you go. Um, so that's 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 my answer to that question. I hope it made some kind of sense. I hope I wasn't just kind of like a load of nonsense. I don't know. Say that. I don't know. Shut up, Dave. I was about to be really negative to myself, and we're not doing it, are we, Dave? No, we're not. Pack it in. <sighs> Breathe. Boom. <sighs> Gone. Okay. So let's move on to the final question of the day. Question four. Now, people too. Okay. So um, question four today is. I like this question. This is a good question as well. Um, guitar production technology has improved over the years so much that the gap between top brands and more affordable guitars has narrowed. Have the likes of Fender and Gibson had their day? Now, that's a really interesting question um, because it is true, definitely true, that you know th- the way squires are built these days is a lot better and it has narrowed the margin between really expensive fenders and squires you know you take like a classic vibe for instance you know uh, the quality of them is unreal yeah the quality of bullet strats is unreal you know um you know i i, I, I would swear by the bullet strats amazing I'd, like i said i'd always put a bullet over an affinity the affinity is actually more expensive but i don't think the affinities are as good sound wise pickup wise the bullets are incredible um, but yeah, could, have the likes of Gibson and Fender had their day though? No, uh, I don't. I would doubt that highly. I mean, there, there's always going to be a demand for guitars with that name on the headstock or a Gibson logo on the headstock, and I would say some of that's down to nostalgia. You know what I mean? It's that is history. That logo there is historical. You know that is a big part of guitar history right there. That logo, the Fender logo, same with the Gibson logo. You know, they're really big parts of guitar history, dating back to you know uh, when Gibson's case, what twenties, uh, something like that. You know, Fender's case, the uh, uh, can't speak. You know, late. You know, well, I suppose it came about in like fifty two with the telly, didn't it? Really, the Fender logo, but I, was, I suppose it kind of was about a little bit before then, but. Um, was it was it before then? I don't know. I'm getting my dates mixed up. People of YouTube. I don't really know. I'm not. I'm no historian. But you know what I mean. Um, but they're iconic. You know what I mean. This is an icon. It's it's much in the same way people still like to wear kind of like um, jeans with Levi's on them, or 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 Hugo Boss, or whatever. You know th- th- these names that have been around forever and ever and ever and ever. You know people like to have them around, and it, in in a way it's a kind of statement. You know what I mean? Like, you know, to have that logo on a headstock or, or where clothes you wear is is a statement. I mean, everything we do is a statement, you know. To have a logo on amp is, is a statement, you know. But, but, um, but it's, there is, there is something cool about having a guitar and I don't think anybody's not guilty of this. I am. That is cool to look down and see that logo on the headstock. You know what I mean? It's cool. I love that. You know, um, it, there's something about it. There is something about having a Fender 
or a Gibson. And that's why I think have their, has their day come. No, because I think there's still a demand for a Fender guitar. It's iconic. You know, there is nostalgia in there, but there's also that kind of desire, you know, of, you know, uh, to own something like that. And that's, that's cool. You know, that is really cool if you want to. If you want to go that route, definitely. Um, but... I do, I do, I do know where you're coming from. In fact, of kind of like it is a, you know, it is kind of like you know, is a Fender any better than this? You know, it's it's subjective. That is though, you know, what you know, there's good Fenders, there's bad Fenders, there's good Squires, and there's bad Squires. You know, it's there's good and bad in everything. But like I say, a good guitar is a good guitar, but it has to be a good guitar to you. You know what I mean? Because somebody could pick this guitar up and absolutely hate it. And go, oh, no, 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 no. Not for me, not for me. Whereas I pick it up and it's like heaven. Every time I pick this thing up, I play, I play this guitar every day. Even if it's just for five minutes, I play this guitar every day. Um, I do believe, though, that I have open circuit uh, neck and bridge pickups um, now, which is a bit of an issue. Uh, but until it dies, they stay. Um, but, that you know, like I say, I mean, this guitar, somebody could hate this. But I love it. So it's it's totally subjective, and it's totally down to you of what you think is good or bad. Um, so I don't I don't think it's, uh, Fender Gibson uh, Martin uh, Mesa Boogie Marshall uh, who else Orange um, Rickenbacker people like that. I don't think they've had their day. Uh, because I think there'll always be a demand for people who want that on the headstock. You know what I mean? And like I say, it's so it's historically cool. You know what I mean? Like you know that that logo is so iconic. You know what I mean? And like uh, I always feel uh, weirdly enough, I don't know why this is, but I always feel the bigger CBS Fender Stratocaster logo is more iconic than the Spaghetti logo. But that's just me. Like the um, the the Jimi Hendrix one. Uh, one sec. Like that. I always feel that one looks more iconic than that one. I think that's because that's bolder and that makes more a statement. And you have Jimi Hendrix attached to that. I don't know. People tube, let me know in your let me know your opinion on on that in the comment section below. Because I always feel that this one kind of gets lost. The spaghetti logo, even though I would say the spaghetti logo is more pretty and gorgeous. The big block strap logo is a real bold statement, in my opinion. You know, look how big that Stratocaster lettering is. You know, what am I? I am a Stratocaster. Whereas, in relation to that, you know, what am I? Stratocaster. You know, this is like, this is like whispering into your ear. Whereas that's like, I'm a Strat! You know, that's really loud and, you know, it's a statement and it's on a big headstock as well. Whereas this is on a skinny little headstock and, you know, it, it, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking into it too much. Possibly so. But, um, but you know what I mean? But like I say, I, do, I don't think that Gibson and Fender have had their day. I do think more affordable Fenders and Gibsons should be available. Like, um, you know, especially Gibson. I think Gibson is stupid with their prices. I mean, it, it, Epiphone aren't great now, but they're owned by Gibson now. So, But I think they always have been, haven't they? they, they Epiphone, uh, Epiphone was bought by Gibson a while back. But, but at least, I mean, the Epiphones used to be affordable. You know, Epiphones used to be affordable Gibsons. You know, uh, when I bought, well, well, I didn't buy, but when I got this bought for me, this one here, you know, it was very cheap. You know, I think it was like 300 quid when we got it. So, you know, now they're really, really expensive. And I just don't, I don't, I don't know. I think, but, and I said, I think that will turn a lot of people off because a lot of people can't afford to buy Fenders and Gibsons in this day and age. I mean, I know I, know I can't, I can't afford to buy, um, like a lot of people ask me to kind of review the Fender Player series, it's like I can't afford to buy that because they're too expensive. They're out of my budget. You know what I mean? I know a lot of people who can't afford to buy Fenders. You know what I mean? I was lucky to buy my Fenders, uh, my White Strap when it was it was cheaper. My White Strap cost me about three hundred and twenty quid or something like that. I forget exactly, but it was you know it was in the three hundreds, low three hundreds, and it's like and that took me months to save up for. You know what I mean? Uh, just putting money away here and there, just trying to you know to, to save up for it. Um, but but no, I don't I don't think for one second that Gibson and Fender have had their day. I really don't. Um, I think there's always going to be a demand, a demand for a, a Fender Stratocaster or a Gibson Les Paul or a Gibson SG or a Fender Telecaster or 
Jazz Master or a Jaguar and, and to have that logo on the headstock. Because there are, there, I mean, there are people who, I've met these people and I'm sure a lot of us have people too. There are people who use that as a boasting thing. Like, I've got a Fender. That means I'm amazing. You know what I mean? There are people like that out there who use that for the wrong reason, you know? Um, but then there are people out there who just want this because of its history, which is what I love about this. This is, this is guitar history, you know, you know, especially this guitar as well. But that logo is guitar history. That is musical history as well, right there in those letters. That is musical history, and I love that. And I... I, I you know, and again, there again, that, that's a different part of musical history. Same thing with the Gibson logo, you know, the, the Les Paul logo and stuff like that. They're all parts of musical history, which is so cool. Uh, so there's always going to be a demand for that. I just don't like people who use it as kind of a boasting right. You know, I've got a Fender Stratocaster. So it's like, big warp, you know. Um, don't use it for that reason. You, you know, you need, you know, if you, you do it for the right reasons, not the wrong ones. Same as anything, really. But, um... But no, I don't, I don't think Fender and Gibson have had their day. I really don't. And um, I think they'll be around for a long time. And, and I say Fender's, Fender Strats will live forever. Fender Telecasters will live forever. You know, same with Gibson Les Pauls. You know, there's, they're, they're always going to be an iconic guitar. So they're always going to be there. And there's always going to be people, uh, there's always going to be people who want a Gibson or a Fender. You know what I mean? And that's cool. You know, that is really cool. I would definitely agree that you don't necessarily need to go out and spend that much money on one of those guitars anymore unless it's very, very special. You know what I mean? That there's certain there are certain situations in your life where you might find a guitar where it's like, I really kind of might need that. You know what I mean? And you, you, you are gonna have to go out your way to, to get it. You know what I mean? Um uh, I mean I've I've got I've got a friend uh, who who bought a fifty two Gibson Les Paul Gold Top and uh he was umming and ahhing about it and eventually he bought it, put himself right out of pocket with it, but he bought it and he owns it and it's just the love of his life. You know, it's the same thing with this for me and, and I know a lot of other people who have bought guitars and it's just like, it, it, at the time it may seem a bit silly, but like there are reasons behind it and it makes sense in the long run, if that, if that makes any sense. But um, invariably, I know what you mean because I do love cheap guitars. Like I say, um, I, I, I've got no desire to own a Gibson Les Paul. Uh over my revelation here uh, I've got no I don't I don't look for it I don't look at them and in all fairness a lot of the Les Pauls I've tried recently they don't do what I want them to do whereas the RTL does exactly what I want it to do and in all fairness this is going to sound a bit weird but uh, for me this is only my opinion this RTL here is the closest Les Paul I've found to a, a real old one I know that's a very very bold statement but um, for me uh, the old Les Pauls I've played sound like this. The new Les Pauls I've played don't sound anything like that. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's me. The way the neck feels, the way the pickups are, the way, how bright they are, and Telecaster esque on steroids. That that, that 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 good old statement that keeps coming up. That is the closest I've found. You know what I mean? Uh, even the Gretsch next to it, the uh, the Electromatic here. That's really dark. That's more. But I would say the Electromatic here is more Gibson esque than the RTL. Uh, that makes no sense. But more... Oh, yeah. The Gretsch here is more modern Gibson. The RTL is more vintage Gibson, if that makes any sense whatsoever. I just find something about that RTL that makes it... It's really bright and aggressive. And the sound... It was a sound I wanted from a Les Paul. Or... I, I, that is the sound I want from a Les Paul. So why would I look elsewhere? You know what I mean? I'm, and plus, I'm a Stratholic. So I love Stratocasters. And I buy them in droves because I'm a bit weird. But that's my Les Paul. Much in the same way as my Oswald Telly is the only Telecaster I need, really. You know what I mean? And because I, I love it. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, you know, that might change because I do love Telecasters and the Les Paul might change. But at this point in time, because things do change, these, you know, I have no desire to even look, you know, for a, another Les Paul or a Telecaster. You know, I'm always on the lookout for Stratocasters. <laughs> Oh, it's a curse. It's not. Oh, I love it. But I love strats. I love, I, I, I mean, yeah, even the gem, which is technically a, a super strat, let's be honest. You know, it, there is just something in a strat, it just, I am a strataholic. My name's Dave and I'm a strataholic. Okay, so, but anyway, I'm worth a point. It's tangent day today, isn't it, people of the tube? Anyway, waffle aside, 
certain guitars are really special, like more special than others. And that brings me back to question three, but we're not going to go there again because we've been there. But yeah, certain guitars are more special than others. And sometimes you just got to roll the dice, you know what I mean? And just take the chance on it. And, um, you know, hope that in a couple of years, you're still in love with it the way you were when, you know, when you, when you first got it. Cause there are sometimes when I've bought guitars, where I'm like, oh, I'm in love with this guitar. And then like a year later, I'm like, I don't really care for this. You know, and that's when the wow factor wears off. Um, and that's when that guitar normally goes, you know, and I, I, I sell them at that point. Uh, anyway, but yeah, but like I say, have Gibson and Fender had their date? No, no, definitely not. No, there's still, still demand for them. But like I say, I mean, I, I do wish they was more affordable, especially Gibson. Gibson are just stupid with their prices and, Fender aren't too far behind with their prices. They're so expensive these days. I mean, I, I know I know a lot of people who would like to have a Fender who can't afford one. And that's really sad because, you know, I, I you know, back in when I, you know, I remember going into guitar shops and seeing a standard Mexican strap for, you could get second hand, you could probably get like 250 for one back in, you know, back when, when I was in old hat, we had a white Fender Mexican strap standard which I should have bought. Stupid boy. That was one of those guitars that, you know, I was saying certain guitars are special and when that happens, you buy it because you won't get another one again. That white uh, Mexican Strat was, that I used in a couple of videos when I was an old hat, was one of those and I lost it forever and that's my own stupidity and that really made it kind of go, I'm not doing that again. I'd rather take a chance on it than and, and not like it in a year's time and sell it than have that feeling of, what if yeah it's better to know than to not you know it's better to uh better to ask questions than not you know uh anyway i'm waffling again anyway people with tube uh but no have fender and gibbs had that i don't think so no i'm gonna put this question to you though people with tube let us know in the comment section below what do you think like i say because of cheap guitars are so good these days you have to go a long way to find bad equipment in this day and age amps pedals and guitars cheap cheap you know budget friendly models are very very awesome you know Squire Bullets, Sub-Zero amps, you know, Boss Katanas. You know what I mean? You, you can't really go wrong with a Boss Katana. If you've got a Boss Katana and a Squire Bullet, you can take over the world. You know what I mean? They, you know, they are that good. You know, uh, you do have to go a long way to find bad gear in this day and age. You know, we are living in a time of unprecedented awesome gear, you know, at every kind of price level. So, have, you know, have Fender and Gibson had their day? Do you think that might be an issue for them? I don't think it is, personally. Like I say, I think there's a lot in having that on the headstock but um you know there's nostalgia but there's also kind of like guitar history there's also boasting rights but they're idiots we don't talk about people who go hey look at me you know don't like that but uh but yeah people with tube let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below let me know anyway people with tube, i'm gonna have to get off because i'm nearly run out of time so anyway i uh, hope you enjoyed this vid hope i've answered your questions okay i know there was a lot of waffle i do apologize if it was just a lot of cack but uh, I hope there's something you can any take away and I hope you enjoyed this vid and I'll see you again on Friday for another one. Have a great morning, afternoon, good evening and goodbye now. Thank you very much indeed for watching.